And good morning, class. We are going to begin again by doing a review of what we did last week. And uh, this uh, set of slides, this is our third week on this set of slides. I am not in a hurry at all to move to the next set because I know that the things we are going to do after this are not hard, but they are going to appear exceedingly hard to most people. And the reason will be that they did not get what is in this uh, set of slides. So I want, to I want to reiterate and go over some things, emphasize some things again. I will run through this, at least the part of it we have already looked at for two weeks, just to remind you and to challenge you on some things to just always keep in mind. You must keep in mind what we are trying to do. I will emphasize that again. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to do? So if we know what we are trying to do, then it will be easier for us to do those things. But if we don't know what we are trying to do and we are just working mathematics like most of you do, just working math. And why, why, why are you working the math? What knowledge are you supposed to gain? How is it supposed to help you with something else? If you don't bear those things in mind, you are just wasting a lot of time. And uh, you might be able to memorize some things, but it takes it you, your, your, your work, your knowledge is more useful and more actionable if you know precisely why you are doing what you are doing. On this page, the important thing for us to emphasize are uh, first of all, how do you differentiate with respect to a large object? when a vector cannot allow division. And you remember that every function has a domain and it has a range. The domain is the values of the argument that you supply, where the, that is the scope in which the argument takes value. The range is the value produced when you substitute, when you, when you impute an argument what is the value? That is the value that it takes. So when, when I talk about a scalar valued function in a scalar domain, that is easy because the input is scalar and the uh, value you obtain is also scalar. But we also know that there can be a vector valued function in the scalar domain. For example, a velocity is the vector valued function. And it can be an effective valued function over time. The domain is time. Because it is a vector valued function over a scalar domain, the time domain is a scalar domain. Because the velocity is a vector valued function over a scalar domain, you can differentiate it with respect to that scalar with the same principles and methods and things you've already known. So even before you got to this class, you've been able to differentiate velocity and obtain acceleration. That's by the fact that velocity is a vector and acceleration is a vector. It didn't matter. If you, had, if you have too much difficulty, you just take taught them to three scalars. You differentiate the velocity uh, in our x axis, then differentiate the velocity in y axis, differentiate the velocity in the z axis, and you just get the three components of the vector acceleration, finish and you use only the knowledge you have always known since secondary school, how to differentiate a scalar with respect to a scalar. That's no problem with that. You only need to rearrange your mind a little bit to differentiate a large object as long as the field, the, the domain of interest is a scalar. It doesn't even matter if it's a tensor. If it's a tensor, you will, nine, you will have nine components. You work the same way you work with the vectors. It's just that you now have more stuff and you will get the answer correctly. And you would not, you shall not have used any knowledge beyond what you have always known. Now, when the domain in consideration is not a scalar, there is there are problems. There are problems. So, and that's what we are trying to do. How do we solve that problem? So we introduce the Gateau as the solution to our inability to divide by tensors when we want to define a derivative with respect to a tensor. 
It is important because every definition of differentiation involves a division. And we are not allowed to divide with respect to a vector or a tensor. Now, we are not allowed to divide with respect to a vector or a tensor. How are we then able to do those ones I've just said? Well, because a vector or a tensor accepts multiplication by a scalar. If you can multiply by a scalar, to divide by the scalar is simply multiplication by the inverse of that scalar. If you multiply by the inverse of that scalar, you have finished your division. There's no problem with that. There's no problem. So, so multiply by the inverse of the scalar is the same thing as dividing with that scalar. But you can say, well, but tensors have inverses. Why can't we just multiply by the inverse of the tensor? You have a problem because don't forget that when it comes to a scalar, only one product is defined. But between vectors and tensors, you have all sorts of products defined. So how do you how do you define the multiplication by scale uh, by the inverse? It is very, very is it uh, a is it a contraction? Is it a composition? Is it uh, there are also many different uh, multiplications. So there is no we cannot do what we are doing when we are dealing with scalars, especially once the domain is not a scalar. It is the, that is where the problem lies. When the domain is not a scalar, what do you do? And the solution is the introduction of the Gato differential. Now, because the Gateau differential is an extension of your present understanding of differentiation, we, we spend time to make sure you remember what differentiation is from the elementary concept, because it is that first principles of differentiation that we are going to extend. We cannot extend your cram cram uh, computation methods of differential. Those ones are just useful for answering questions. They don't shed significant uh, insight into what's going on. What sheds insight is your first principles definition. So we spend time to make sure that first principles definition is clear to you, is remembered by you, and you know precisely what it means. And I am not tired of saying it again, because very soon I will be moving fast. <laughs> And the only thing that you may be thinking that I'm moving so fast, but if you do not understand anything, this is where your problem is. So get it straight now. When I, the, the first thing we define is limit. If I say the limit of a function as we are approaching this x naught, the limit of this function as we are approaching this x naught is w naught. What I mean is that if I take the value of the function as we are approaching x naught, and subtract it from what I am calling its limit, and I take the absolute value of that, I can make it smaller than any pre-assigned value. I can make it smaller. I can say my pre-assigned value is 0 0.1. I can say my pre-assigned value is 0 0.001. I can say my pre-assigned value is 0 0.0000001. It doesn't matter how small my pre-assigned value is. I will always be able to make the difference smaller than that pre-assigned value. When that is possible, just by reducing the neighborhood of interest. Once that is possible, we say the limit exists. If that does not work, then the limit does not exist. That is the definition of limit. So the limit we say x, x not, for let x, x not and w not be all real numbers. We can say that the limit of a scalar valued function, real function, is equal to w not f of x. The limit of f of x is not w not. If for any pre-assigned real number greater than zero, that is a pre-assigned positive number, no matter how small, we can always find a real number delta such that the magnitude of f of x minus w naught is less than epsilon whenever we are in we, 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 we are in the delta neighborhood. We, that is the difference between x and x naught is within what I've showed in the graphics there. The function is said to be continuous if f of x naught exists and it is to w naught. So it pos it's possible for a function to have a limit without being continuous. So, so the continuity is an extra demand. 
the limit can exist, but if it's possible for the limit to exist without the function even existing at that point. But if it exists at that point, and the value at that point is the same thing as its limit at that point, then we say that that function is continuous. This is the idea we are, we are going, we are about to expand. And I am just reminding you what you already know. And it is important for you to be properly reminded. I, last week, I used these graphics to explain it, to make sure you remind, just to continue to remind you. Because I just used a spreadsheet here. And then I went and uh, I looked at the scalar value function of scalar arguments and see what we mean by that. And then we looked at vector valued function of scalars. And you know that we can decide to operate them as three scalars and that will be okay and will be okay. And then I said, are there scalar valued functions of vectors where the domain is a vector or the domain is a tensor? That scalar value function of vector and tensor arguments. Are there examples? Oh yes, there are examples. An example is the magnitude of velocity, which you call speed. And the magnitude of a vector is a scalar valued function of a vector. Its value is a scalar, but the input argument or the domain is the vector. Similarly, the three principal invariants of tensors, and they are all scalars. I1, which is the, which is the trace, I2, which is uh, the trace of the cofactor, and I3, which is the determinant, are all scalar. We defined all these things. They are all scalar valued functions of a tensor, of tensor argument. So the input, the domain is the tensor, and the value. When you supply the tensor, the trace will be a scalar. When you supply the tensor, the trace of the cofactor will be a scalar. When you supply the tensor, the trace of the determinant will be a scalar. They are all scalar valued functions of tensor arguments. Can we differentiate these with respect to their arguments? No, we cannot do that with the knowledge we have so far. We need new knowledge to so find DDV of magnitude of V, DDT of I3 T, DDT of the determinant of T, all those things require the knowledge of differentiation you have right now will not work. Simple. So because of that, we need more knowledge. And that extra knowledge will be obtained by expanding the definition of what do we mean by limit and what do we mean by continuity. Are there tensor valued functions of tensor arguments? Of course, plenty. One quick example is the cofactor of T, which is f of T. You supply T, it gives you the cofactor T, which is equal to, which is defined as the T C, and it's equal to T inverse determinant of T for vector for tensors that have inverses. For tensors that have that do not necessarily have inverses, where we cannot assume that an inverse exists, we have a far more fundamental definition in saying that the cofactor of a tensor is the transformation of area when the lengths are transformed by the tensor. If the lengths are transformed by T, the areas are transformed automatically by the cofactor. Because if you transform the area, the, the length of the size of a parallelogram, the area of that parallelogram is not transformed by the same tensor. It's only the, that area is transformed by its cofactor. Similarly, when it is volumes you are transforming, if you have transformed the Sides of a parallel pipe, the uh, size of a parallel pipe. The volume is transformed by the determinant, not by the tensor itself, but by the third principal invariant. So those are things that we've already settled in the properties of tensor. So this is one of the examples. There are other examples. Its value is a tensor, the argument is a tensor, it is a tensor. Differentiating it defies all the mathematics you know so far. Even if you got A1 all the way to this point, you will fail in this one unless you learn something new. It will not work. So, but you can still continue doing well by the time you listen to this and you add this to your knowledge. The differentiation of a scalar valued function of a vector or a tensor is already problematic. You have been limited to functions that have scalar arguments so far. We began to consolidate that before introducing any new things. Master that first. So we now came here 
and we now started differentiating uh, large objects. Uh, we are differentiating uh, a, a function, large objects that are function of time and that are function of scalars. We we looked at when you differentiate that with a, a scalar multiplication, and then we got this table. We got this table, and in this table, you remember that everything here we are still differentiating with respect to the scalar. We spent time on this to show what this one will mean. Uh, the the it is a it is a tensor or vector valued function of a scalar that is still the easy one, and uh, we spent time on this and we went to some examples, looking at the constancy of the identity tensor, and uh, we looked at the fact that if you differentiate at the uh, orthogonal tensor, it gives you an idea of a particular product of the derivative of the orthogonal tensor with its transpose. And we say that that tensor is nicely skewed. And because it is skewed, it has, uh, it has an easier vector. We, we went on that and were able to create the argument for uh, when you when something has a rotation that it will have an angular velocity that uh, we, we did that. So you please re revise this. We went on and on here, but we are still differentiating with respect to scalar function. We, we are still differentiating the big, fun the big uh, function with respect to a scalar. This is one other result we, we derived in the last two weeks that we need to, to take a look. To obtain the derivative of the trace of a tensor, we take the trace of the differentiated tensor, the differentiated tensor. Trace is a linear operator. It follows immediately that the, 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 uh, the differentiation of trace with respect to a scalar is the trace of the derivative. The derivative of a trace is the trace of the derivative. This, yeah, we continue coming up. So let us uh, see why it is so. To differentiate the trace, we select three arbitrary linearly independent uh, constant uh, vectors A, B, and C that are in the Euclidean vector space. Then we write D, D, T of uh, I1 is D, D, T of trace of A. And D, D, T, this is the definition of the trace of A. And remember that what we have in the square bracket is triple product. It's a scalar triple product. So it's a product of uh, this A, A. This is, so if, if A is a variable with respect to scalar time, for instance, or T, whatever, it's only, the, it's only one term in the three products that is uh, a variable. All the other terms are constants. Therefore, if you apply DDT to this sum, you differentiate them one by one. So you differentiate this one. When you differentiate this one, this is the only thing that is varying. Everything else is uh, constant. Here, this is the only thing that is varying. Everything else is constant. And here, this is the only thing that is varying. And if you look at that, that is the trace of the ADT. This is the definition of the trace of the ADT. So you can see that DDT of trace A is the trace of the ADT. So when we use this later on, it's because we're sure and we can prove that it is, that, that equality is there. Trace is a linear operation. So if you take the trace as an operation, it's linear. The trace of a sum is the sum of the trace. The trace of a weighted sum is the weighted sum of the traces. And the trace of a derivative is the derivative of the trace. So there's no trace of a derivative is the derivative of the trace. So this is the trace of a derivative here, and it is the derivative of the trace. And then we went to some examples uh, here where we say, where we try to calculate the, the, the uh, with the differentiate with respect to T, the determinant of A. So, and we got this. By, by the time we walk through here, we got this. And this is a very important uh, result called Liu Willis theorem, where when we get into continuum mechanics proper, this is going to come up. Okay, so. So this is where we reached last time. This is where we reached. When the domain, we, we, said we are now looking at vector and tensor arguments. We, have now, we are now leaving the situation where we have scalar argument and we are looking at vector and tensor arguments. When we are looking at vector and tensor arguments, it doesn't matter whether the function itself is scalar valued 
whether the function is vector valued, whether the function is tensor valued. The mere fact that the domain is vector and tensor argument is what causes problem. Big problem, really big problem that we have to now look for more mathematics to be able to tackle. And you will see that what you will read in other textbooks, the proofs of those things will be in this course. So you, you get to a place when they will say, the grad of uh, a scalar is this. And they just give you the formula. You say, why? <laughs> you say, don't ask us, that's the grad. And then you say, we can tensor, can vector have grad? You say, don't ask us that one, that's beyond you. You will see why they are saying so like that. Everything can have grad, but at that point, nobody can tell you anything beyond the grad of a scalar because the grad of a scalar is a vector. But the grad of a vector is a tensor. If nobody has taught you about tensor, the person cannot be telling you about the grad of a vector. So you will think vectors don't have grad. They do have grad. And then tensors, ten second order tensor has grad, and it's, uh, grad is the third order tensor. So grad increases the order of any object by one. So, so the, when the domain of differentiation itself is, is made up of large objects, the task of differentiation becomes more demanding. So, and such problems are standard in continuum mechanics. For example, the strain energy function is a scalar, yet we can obtain strains which are tensors from it by differentiating it with respect to stress. If we differentiate the strain energy function with respect to another tensor, you it's a scalar differentiated with respect to a tensor, and the answer it gives you is a tensor. So we are dealing here with differentiation of scalar functions of a tensor stress. Let us look again at velocity gradient. If velocity is defined over uh, a, a Euclidean point space, every distance there is a vector, is every, every point there is a position vector. So if you want to take a derivative of the velocity, with respect to the spatia, uh, this, is the, this is different from getting acceleration. Velocity gradient is not acceleration. Uh, let me try and find this picture again in a place that is less problematic. Let's see whether we started with that. We didn't start with it here. Uh, we can look at this one. Look at this background. Look at this background uh, picture here. Just let us see the arrows there are representing velocities in magnitude and direction all around. If this one is pointing like upward, this one is pointing leftwards, this point is pointing leftwards, some will be pointing rightwards and all those ones. But the important, partially, as you move from point to point, the velocity is changing. So we are now talking of velocity as a function, not of time, but of space. You, you, if you see, it's a three-dimensional space, you need x, y, and z. And at every point there, a position vector is defined. So the velocity now is a velocity function of a vector location. If you now want to differentiate it with respect to the location, you are going to get a quantity called velocity gradient. Velocity gradient is not a, ve is not a vector. Velocity gradient is a tensor because you are differentiating velocity with the vector position, the vector position, which is the position vector. And we, we are now going to get, when we are differentiating the velocity field, defined on the Euclidean point space with respect to the position vector of the points. So that is why it is a tensor. In this and several other derivatives of interest, the domains are no longer in the real scalar space. The domain here, the, the, the space in which you live, is not a scalar space because you need, it's a Euclidean point space. And at every point, a vector is defined, which we call the position vector. So you are moving, in a, you are living in a vector space. So is it, there's a difference when you are differentiating with respect to time, which is, the, which is scalar, as, as, uh, or if you are differentiating with respect to length, which is also a, on a straight line, that's a scalar. But when you are now differentiating with respect to position vector in three-dimensional space, you are now trying to differentiate with respect to a vector. And the answer you will get is going to be a tensor. You will see why it is so shortly. Therefore, I showed you this last week, I think. If there are vector and tensor arguments, this, this page is an error page. So there is nothing correct on this page. 
but it is uh, a rote translation of what you found from uh, your scalar analysis. We can say this is if somebody just translated all that we were doing before into this, this is what the person will get. That we, let us say x and h are vectors, derivative f prime of x, that f prime being a vector function of a vector argument. Uh, it's not properly defined. You cannot define it like this. You cannot say it is the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And we said, because this creates several problems. One, the division by vectors is not defined. Two, there are many ways h can tend to zero, which can be achieved, that can be achieved. Similar problems when the argument is a tensor. So this is not correct. The question is, what then is correct? The approach to this challenge is twofold. First of all, recognize that vectors and tensors live in their respective Euclidean vector space. The space is Euclidean as soon as the concept of length or magnitude is defined. Remember that when we are dealing with vectors, the concept of magnitude is defined. In fact, that is what we use length of a vector to represent. We are using it to represent the magnitude. So there's no problem with the length of the vector. When we are talking of tensors, the square root of the inner product of the tensor with itself is the magnitude. So even whether you are looking at tensor spaces or vector spaces, the concept of magnitude is defined. So they are both Euclidean spaces. So the only thing that is necessary is that in the space we are dealing with, that the space we are dealing with is a Euclidean space. It can be a Euclidean vector space, and the Euclidean tensor space is also a Euclidean vector space in the sense that if you look at the generalized definition of the vector space. So as long as that space exists, where length exists, where you can you have a meaning for length, there is no problem. That's all we shall need to be able to, uh, to equip ourselves for the battle of getting a definition for differentiation with respect to vector or tensor arguments. Such a generalization is in the Gateau differential. Now we consider a map. Uh, when you see a map in, the, in this person, you say, just look at it as a table. You have a table, remember the way when you have your function, y is equal to a function of x. You put x on one column, you put y on another column. You put a value for x, then you calculate the value for y. You put another value for x, you calculate the value for y. When you do that, what that table is called a map. That is, every value of x is mapped. Is, 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 it has a corresponding value of y. That is what, even this formula, that's what it means. This maps the domain V to W, both of which are Euclidean vector spaces. The concept of limit and continuity carries naturally from the real space to any Euclidean vector space. So let us see how the concept of limit and continuity carry from the Euclidean, uh, that, that is carry, it's not uh, carry, sorry, there's a grammar error there. So, so this is the con this concept carry naturally from real spaces to uh, Euclidean vector space. So here is now the correct, what we, what we did wrongly here, we're now doing it rightly on slide 31. So let V not be a vector and W not be in another vector space. So put big V and big W are vector spaces. So let V not and W not be vectors. As usual, we can say that the limit as tends to V not of F of V is equal to W not means that if for any pre-assigned real number, epsilon greater than zero, just the way we were doing before, no matter how small, we can always find real number delta greater than zero, such that the magnitude of FV minus W naught is no longer the absolute value, but now the magnitude of FV minus W naught is less than epsilon whenever V minus V naught is less than delta. The function is said to be continuous if F of V naught exists and F of V naught is equal to W naught. If you look at this statement deeply, you will see that except for some specific uh, changes, it's almost a mirror of, the, of this statement that we had here. 
this statement we had on the second page, I think, is, is on page four. This statement, what you are having now is that it is a vector tending to a vector, and it is a vector function of a vector, and is equal to a vector. And the statement is reading for any real number still, but here you are having the magnitude of the difference between the vector function and the vector limit, the magnitude, because the magnitude is a scalar, so we can compare it to epsilon. And then again, the distance here is the vector distance, which is a scalar, which is a vector magnitude. And then the function, everything is repeat of what you have there. So except that we are now looking at, uh, except we are now looking at magnitudes of vectors. So this, so if you understand what I had on page four very well, this should not be a problem. But if you don't understand that, then you will start cramming here, which is very bad. I don't want you to start your cramming too early. Understand and let us move on. Specifically, let this particular map that we are interested in be uh, we write it as D, big D now, of f of x plus h. We say, let us say it is the limit as alpha tends to zero of f of x plus alpha h minus f of x over alpha. So this is a function of two variables, a function of x and of h. And you can, I want somebody to tell me why on the left-hand side, alpha is not appearing and there's alpha everywhere else. Why is it that we don't see anything on alpha on the left-hand side? Why is this Why is this definition correct when there is alpha appearing here and there's no alpha on this side? Please go to the chat room and tell me. Why? Why is it just a function of X and H? Is the class awake? Okay, Ajibola says, because alpha, why is uh, alpha not appearing on the left uh, on the left hand side? Uh, Ajibola, you are not right. I want somebody to tell me why is there? There is x here. There is x here. There is h here. There is h there. Because we are mapping to a different Euclidean space. No. Don't forget that by the time we by the time we finish this limit, alpha would have. Alpha was tending to zero, so alpha would have essentially become zero. So alpha would have been neutralized out. We are by the time we finish the computation. So that is why alpha doesn't need to appear on the left hand side. We are going to take the limit as alpha tends to zero. So there will be no alpha would have been neutralized by the time we complete that limit taking. So, so alpha is a dummy. It can be beta, it can whatever you put there, it's not important. It's just that it's just what is helping you. It's just what is helping you to find the limit. You are trying to find the limit. Uh, so that is the reason. It tends to zero. So there is no reason. I should come again. I'm not going to come again. Next time I will type my question because uh, that means you were sleeping or not listening. So we focus attention. We focus attention here. We focus attention here on the second variable, H. Why we allow the dependency on X to be as general as possible. So we have this function that we are defining here, which is the limit as alpha tends to zero of f of x plus alpha h minus f of x over alpha. We, we call this quantity d of f of x h. This is what is defined as the gateau differential. This quantity here, which, which takes f of x plus alpha h, subtracts f of x, divides by alpha, and take the limit of, and takes the limit of this quotient as alpha tends to zero. This is the definition of the gateau differential. And we say it is equal to this quantity on the right hand side. We say that without proof. And it is not obvious. Every time I get to this point, I struggle with it. It's not obvious. So because it's not obvious, I will prove it. So that uh, because there's the only way. Uh, and why do we need to prove it? Because this is actually the computation formula for the Gateau differential. Many times this is all you will do to get the Gateau differential. You will not find, instead of finding this limit, you find that 
this is easier to compute. So this is the computation formula for the Gato differential. So it is important for us to establish this second equality. But this first one is the definition. This is the quantity that defines the Gato differential. So you can see that we, in a very clever way, we have taken a limit, which is a quotient, without having to divide by any vector or any tensor. What we are dividing with is a real number. That real number comes in, and that's all. So we focus on the second variable, h, where we allow the dependency on x to be as general as possible. We shall show that while the above function can be any given function of x, linear or nonlinear, the above map is always linear in H, irrespective of what the kind, what kind of Euclidean space we are mapping from or into. It is called the Gateau differential. So what is Gateau differential? Gateau differential is this quantity here. And that Gateau differential is equal to this quantity here. And this quantity is its computation formula. This computation formula, I shall prove to you its equality with this. But I, I don't need to prove this one because this is the definition. Anytime you see this symbol, this is what it represents. So this is an identity. This is just the shorthand for writing. So when you have D of F of X, H, this is what you mean by that, but it is equal to this quantity here. So there's the need to establish this because you will be using this to compute the Gato differential anytime you need it. So what we shall show that while the above function can be any, it can be any function, but it is always linear in H. It's always linear in H. It may not necessarily be linear in X, it's always linear in H. Now, before we establish, before we try to understand the Gato differential too deeply, let us first of all show that this second equality is true. How do we show it? The second equation above is not obvious. It can be shown by remembering that the scalar formula for the derivative, by remembering the scalar formula for derivative and treat this quantity, even though we know this is a vector function of a vector, but we can, we can create a selective amnesia and forget that it's a function of a vector and just treat it as it's a function of the scalar alpha. You treat it as a function of alpha alone. Uh, let us see what that means. Then we can we can now compute d phi the alpha just by if we say it's a function of alpha. So it is limit as delta alpha tends to zero of phi of alpha plus delta alpha minus phi of alpha over delta alpha. That is, but if we if we plug this back, if we plug this back into the right hand side. So what is uh, what is phi of alpha plus delta alpha? Any time you see alpha, you replace it by alpha plus delta alpha. So when you see f of x plus alpha h, you replace this alpha plus alpha with alpha plus delta alpha, and you get this alpha plus delta alpha h. And then minus phi of alpha, which is uh, this one over delta alpha, limit as delta alpha tends to zero. We are looking, treating that as just, we are looking only at alpha. We, we're forgetting where it's coming from. Just, uh, if that is the case, what then is, did the alpha of f of, of f of x plus alpha h, if we allow alpha to be zero? If we allow alpha to be zero, we can then turn all the alphas that are inside this place to be zero. So alpha here is zero, so it becomes f of x plus delta alpha h. Because the fact that alpha is zero doesn't mean that we cannot have a small neighborhood of it and we take, so that's delta alpha h is there. And then uh, if we have alpha is zero, this one becomes zero. So, so we have f of x plus delta alpha h minus f of x over delta alpha. So what we need to do now is to change the value of delta alpha. Let's change it to something else, call it beta. So instead of limit as delta alpha tends to zero, we say limit as beta tends to zero, f of x plus beta h over beta. So it no longer matters whether it is alpha or beta you use. It's a dummy variable. So it is the same thing. So you can see that this quantity here, 
which we have on the right hand side of our expression here is exactly the same as the Gato differential. So we have proved it on this page. So, so this page proves the equality here. The equality here is proven on this line. So that is the proof of that. So because of that, anytime I ask you for the Gato differential, you can either use this formula or this formula because both of them are the same. This is the definition. And this is something that we have proved to be equal to the set definition. So we can use this or this, use whichever one is convenient for us. So we go back again now. So now we now go to try to understand this Gato differential. What we, are, what we shall do to start with, we will go back and then say, okay, suppose what we have is a scalar function of a scalar domain. Instead of a vector function, a vector domain. What will it become? Suppose we degenerate everything to a scalar. What will this expression become? It will be instructive for us to know if x was, a, was instead of x being a Euclidean point space, just a number on the x axis. And h is just a small change on that. So that everything, both left and right, are scalars. What happens? So that is what we are going to do. So real function in real domains. So in H becomes just a small change in uh, there's X and there's H. Both of them are real, are real numbers. So you now have uh, yeah, D of X and delta and DX. So we are changing everywhere we see H, we change it to DX. Every time we see H, we change it to DX. So f of x plus h before that becomes of x plus alpha, x plus alpha h because f of alpha dx and f of x because f of small x over alpha. Remember now that everything here, they are all scalars now. And we say it will be equal to d the alpha of f of x plus alpha h, which is x plus alpha dx at alpha is equal to zero. So what then happens? If we allow, if we write instead of alpha dx, we call that delta x. Then that means that dx would simply be delta x over alpha. So if we if we if we change that, if we change that, what do we have? Then alpha then because sorry, alpha then becomes alpha then becomes delta x over dx. So if we substitute, if we substitute here, so when alpha tends to zero, delta x tends to zero. Then you have f of x. So we, if instead of alpha dx here, we have delta x. Below here, we have delta x here. And then remember that alpha is delta x over dx. So that dx will come and multiply here. What does the Gato differential become when everything is real? From which it is obvious the Gato differential is simply a generalization of the well-known differential from elementary calculus. So, if everything is real, it just gen degenerates to the elementary calculus. So the Gato differential is a generalization of the well-known differential from elementary calculus. It's not different. If everything becomes real, what we call the Gato differential is just the ordinary differential and computes a local approximation to any function, linear or non-linear. So you, when everything is real, the Gato differential is ordinary differential. So this is the differential now. Okay, so we are going to get into some, some uh, other issues here, linearity. We want to show that Gato differential is linear in its argument. If you multiply the second argument by A, it is the same thing as multiplying the whole function by A. If you add, if you add, uh, if you, add, if you add another function, another variable to, to the second argument, it's the same thing as if you have two, two of them. One has the first variable, the second has the second variable. It is so, it is so all the, all the, all the, behavior of linearity in the second argument is obeyed by the Gato differential. So 
this is this on this page we prove that if you if you multiply uh, h by a you multiply the same thing the whole thing by a if you multiply h by beta you multiply the whole thing by beta so that is what this page proves so the gateau differential is a linear function in the second argument it's linear in the second argument so you base linearity in the second argument points to note that all differential is not unique to the point of evaluation. Rather, at each point, there is a different differential for each vector h. If the domain is a vector space, then we have a Gato differential for each of the infinitely many directions at each point. In two or more dimensions, there are infinitely many Gato differentials at each point. H may not be even be a vector, but a second or higher order tensor. It doesn't matter. As tensors themselves are in a Euclidean space, that define magnitude. The magnitude is the inner product of the of the vector of the tensor with itself, and direction. We also define the direction. So anything that has anywhere you can define magnitude and direction is in Euclidean space. Second, the Gateau differential is a one-dimensional calculation along a specified direction h, and because it's one-dimensional, you can use ordinary one-dimensional calculus to compute it. Product rules and other constructs for the differentiation in real domains apply. So we have, we have finished the first part of it. And uh, before we go, before I let you go on break, remember what we are doing here. What we are doing here is that we needed to define a new differential that will take care of vectors and tensors. The differential we had before is not good enough for us to work on vectors and tensors. But we have a new differential that takes care of that, and it's called the Gato differential. And we showed that that Gato differential is the same as the ordinary differential if we go back to real function in a real variable. And secondly, it has two arguments. It can vary, it can be, it can be linear or non-linear with respect to the first argument, but with respect to the second argument, it is always linear. So the Gato differential is a linear function in the second argument. And we showed all the possibility of linearity multiplied by add, add two together, multiply by scalar, or do a, a scaled, a weighted average, or weighted sum. Everything the weighted in the, in, the, in a linear function, the weighted sum of the function is the function of the weighted sum. So that is the kind of thing uh, we have already proved. So this is uh, where we end this set of slides that we have used three weeks to go through. We went through this in three weeks and it is good that it's all in the same way. So if you have any reviews to do, you review this one. We will take uh, 